Hi. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. I always seem to start my um, podcast with hello, how are you? Because I don't know what else to do because I have no idea who the person's going to be. Well, I know who you are. <laughs> you do know who I am. But who I are you? I have an advantage. You, yes, you definitely do. Who are you? <laughs> my name is Rick Minnick. I am an American documentary filmmaker living in Berlin, Germany. Ah, a documentarian. Yes. I like it. And clearly you have kids because in the background you have like Twister, Pictionary. <laughs> yeah, I have five kids. Oh, wow. Yeah. And what kind of documentaries do you do? Oh, I've made all kinds. I uh, The best known one is called Forgetting Dad. It's about my father who suffered a strange case of amnesia uh, following a car accident. He just woke up one day and didn't know who he was. and. His memory never came back, even though the doctor said it should. So I uh, made a film about it and turned it into kind of a medical mystery. Um, that was uh, well, 2008. It's out there in the world, uh, available to watch. I made one about uh, unexploded World War II bombs that are still in the ground here in Germany. There's a lot of them, about 100,000 estimated. And sometimes they go off and kill people. So I, uh, I made a film about a guy... Uh, just outside Berlin, whose house got blown up by one of these bombs when uh, it was found in his backyard and the uh, bomb squad couldn't defuse it. So they had to do a controlled detonation and it blew up his house. Wow. So, uh, that's pretty bad. Did he, did, did he survive? He survived. No, he was evacuated and they kind of like put up all these hay bales to help uh, sort of like, uh, yeah, prevent the explosion from expanding too far but you know, it was just a few meters from his house and just left this huge crater in the ground. So I followed this guy's story for the next year as he was trying to recover from it. And local people or bands were doing fundraisers to raise money for him to rebuild. And I followed the bomb squad guys and the mayor who was trying to lobby the federal government for more money to look for bombs. And yeah, it was quite a, it, it, it kind of fit in with like one of my big passions, which is about, uh, yeah, peacemaking and uh, so an anti-war message. And uh, that's the film that I really kind of wanted to talk to you about is this one I just made called The Straight Guys that's uh, being released um, here next month in Germany. And it's played, it has world premiere in Brazil last month. And it's uh, it's about this these a group of Americans and Russians who are trying to build the world's longest train tunnel beneath the Bering Strait. They want to connect North America and Asia by rail. So the whole entire world would be connected by, by railroads. Wow. And, and that's interesting and, uh, that it's the Americans and the Russians. Yeah. Working well, together. <laughs> I started making it in 2010 and uh, we filmed through 2009 and it, we finished it about six months ago. And, you know, before this disaster in Ukraine started. So, um, but anyway, I, I had this globe here. I'm sure you know where the Bering Strait is, but if anyone's watching this, I would carry this around when I would talk to people about, about the film, like when I was pitching it to try to get funding and stuff. And I would say, hey, look, it's right up here. Here's Alaska and here's Russia. And it's only a hundred kilometer, or it's actually only 80 kilometers across, 50 miles of water. And when we were filming there on the Alaskan side on, on Wales, just like the, the westernmost point of the continental U.S., um, a Russian couple arrived on this catamaran, catamaran that they had built themselves. And the night before, they had floated across from Russia with like a little two horsepower motor. It took them 14 hours. And, and then they, they just landed on the beach in the U.S. It was the most bizarre thing. And it was like, whoa we're really we're really neighbors it's like really close and their goal was to travel all the way around the world without flying so they had started in in moscow and they took the trans-siberian railway as far as they could get and then built their boat and floated up the the lena river here and along the northern coast of 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 russia and then through to Alaska to the Yukon River and then they went inland and then they started traveling by by road again by land did the immigration not stop them? 
there's no one there. It's like a village with 150 native people that, in Wales, the, the, the narrowest point of the Bering Strait. So there was, yeah, they, they didn't know what to do with these people. There's no customs or anything or no, no immigration, but they, they had to go. They checked in at the port in Nome, Alaska, like a little further co- down the coast. And then they actually had to show their passports and stuff. And they had visas for the U.S. They'd organized oh, okay, all that. Okay. Did they, did they ever manage to circumnavigate the world without flying? Well, they went, they got all the way down to Brazil and then COVID started and they got stuck and they were trying to take a, find a ship to take them over to Africa, but it it just, it just didn't work out. And then, um, uh, they, I guess they split up or something. I don't know quite all the details. I know that Sergei has went back to Moscow and Yana ended up somewhere in uh, the San Francisco Bay area. She's still there now. Well, maybe at some point they'll manage to do it. So, what what exactly is is the movie is the movie about? Did, well, it's about. I'm assuming I'm assuming they haven't built the tunnel. I would have heard no, that. no, no, no. They haven't built it. The idea actually goes back to the 1860s. the the first The first idea of building a tunnel there, and then it it almost like the money was raised for it. A large part of the money was raised for it in like 1905, and it looked like it's going to happen. And then there was a an intrigue in the czar's court and uh, someone said, Oh, if you build this tunnel, then the Americans are going to come through and invade. And, and then, you know, the, uh, the Russian revolution started in world war one and then world war two and the cold war and all these wars kept getting in the way. But at the, at the end of the cold war, this um, some Americans and Russians started to revive this idea that, you know, we can do this and, and it makes sense. And it started to kind of gain momentum and I, I just, um, I'd remembered in high school, like growing up and seeing the maps on the wall. And I grew up in a home, we had a globe where you could actually see that and back then it was the Soviet Union, but you could actually see that the, the Soviet Union and the US are like really close together. And it always fascinated me. And then when I started hearing maybe like 20 years ago, I heard this idea about this tunnel, I did a little bit of research and I found this, found out that there's this guy, George Kumal, a Czech born mining engineer who lived in Tucson, Arizona. I kept reading about him. So one day I just called him up. I looked him up in the phone book and called him up and he was super happy. Someone was interested in his idea. And he's like, oh, I'm going to be in Washington in a couple of months, Washington DC for a US Russian conference. So I flew over and, and met him and, uh, it was just the craziest thing. It turns out he had an, a partner in Alaska, Joe Henry, a, a lawyer there. And they were like this oddball, old, funny old guys, kind of like the odd couple type type of characters. And I'm like, wow, these guys would be great film characters. And we ended up in the weirdest places. Like we ended up at the Russian embassy at some uh, meeting, the Russian ambassador at some reception. And there was like this Russian band playing music and stuff. And we had a meeting with a, a U.S. congressman, Dennis Kucinich, who was back then was in the uh, Foreign Relations Committee in the House of Representatives. And people like we started meeting, in, you know, pretty high up people. And I was like, oh, I wonder where this is going. And then they said, oh, you got to come to the, you know, in a few months, we're going to go to the English Channel to check out the, the Euro Tunnel and see how it works. And they, and they said, you got to come. You got to, you know, and then. Like, you got to be at this station in Paris at this time and someone will meet you and we're going to all ride the Eurostar through the tunnel. And I, I showed up there and there's some Korean guy with holding a sign with my name on it. And he's like, Mr. Minnick, come with me. <laughs> and he got me on the train. And when I arrived on the English side, there were all these Korean guys wearing these funny hats that they'd made, like these Australian outback hats with this embroidery on them. They'd made them extra for the occasion, this channel, the channel visit. And it turns out the South Koreans were investing money on in all this. And I was like, well, I can't figure this out. What's, what's going on? And they all explained to me, they said, well, South Korea is an island, essentially, if you look at a map, because there, there's North Korea above them, and there's no transportation between North and South Korea. So South Korea, the only way that they can export goods, import and export goods, is by air and by sea. So they're interested in having a, a rail connection, a land connection to Russia and China. And they said, hey, if we can get to the United States and Canada as well, to North America, even better. So they were getting all involved in it. 
and it, it just kind of built and built. And I kept following these guys around and then I started getting funding to make the film. And then in, in 2018, we took a big trip to Alaska um, to the Bering Strait and visited all these communities where the tunnel would be built just to talk to the people and to find out how they feel about it and, and all this. And then we went to Moscow and the guys ended up giving a presentation at the, at the Duma, at the Russian parliament. And we went to Yakutsk in Eastern Siberia to visit the, to see the end of the rail line, to, to see where the Russians are actually building tracks towards the Bering Strait. And that was like a, a real highlight because you could see the actual construction work and, and see that they're like, they're planning, they have their plans to get to the Bering Strait by like in the next 20 years or so, regardless of whether the U.S. builds on the U.S. side, the U.S. and Canada, because they just, they have this whole eastern part of their country with no transportation, only only flying. And they know that they've got a lot of mineral riches and oil and gas and gold and diamonds, and all kinds of stuff there that they're trying to get to. So... <laughs> I mean, this sounds this sounds like a uh, a great adventure, like the documentary oh, yeah. sounds like it's a great adventure. Oh yeah, it it was a great adventure, and, and filming it and yeah, uh, lots of <laughs> lots of fun. And some people say, oh yeah, it sounds like a totally crazy idea, but it's it's like geologically, it's it's uh, technolo- technically, it's the, they the engineers say that um, it would be easier to build than the Euro Tunnel. Because uh, under the, the Bering Strait is quite shallow; it's only fifty meters deep, you know, like a you know one hundred and eighty feet or whatever. Um, and it's really it's mostly solid granite. It's much easier to to just drill through to build a tunnel. But um, it's really a political problem between the U.S. and Russia, and uh, especially now with uh, this war in Ukraine, it's become even more of a problem. And and uh, <laughs> that's but that's kind of where we're at. I. I I'm, I've always been interested in underdog stories and people who have big ideas who are trying to, to change the world. And I latched onto these guys and ended up in some strange places and um, lived to tell it. <laughs> and now I'm here talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were pitching it, which you've already mm-hmm. done, right? And you've already filmed it and it's coming out. Yeah. But if you were pitching it to someone that needed to understand what the documentary was within 30 mm-hmm. seconds, how would you say it? Because to me, oh. you've explained uh, this amazing adventure, but I still am not fully, I don't really know what it, what it is. So can you pitch it to me? This is a story about the, 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 the people behind the Intercontinental Railway, which would link North America and Asia with the world's, via the world's longest train tunnel beneath the Bering Strait. It would be the Panama Canal of the 21st century and would open up a global trade route uh, that would completely change the way goods are transported in the world these days. Marvelous. Do you have a trailer? Yeah, yeah. I would love you to send me the trailer. Yeah, sure. It's the it's the the straight guys, S-T-R-A-I-T, like Bering Straight. The straightguys.com is the website. And you can see the trailer on there and and gives a a good flavor for the film. Okay. And are you on camera? Um, I narrate the film from my perspective. Okay. You'd see me in a photograph at the end, but but otherwise it's, I tell it as a first person story, my okay. journey with these guys, with okay. George, the main character, especially. Um, but no, I'm not on camera. Okay, cool. And, and what inspired you to become a documentarian? Like what, in, you seem to like have an effervescent um, <laughs> personality, which, you know, why, why did you do that? Why did you become a, um, a documentarian? Well, I had no intentions to. It was kind of by accident. Um, I grew up in in the Los Angeles area, kind of the, the suburbs of the suburbs uh, in Santa Clarita, very white conservative place. And where I, as a teenager, I discovered I wanted to get out of there and uh, ended up going to New York to go to college. Um, and back then I thought I wanted to be a newspaper journalist, like in the mid 1980s. And I, I worked at my local newspaper for a couple of summers, but then I was like, ah, no, this isn't what I want to do. And when I got to New York, I fell in love with cinema. There are all these old art house movie theaters. I would go and watch a lot of classic films, a lot of European films, especially. And I decided I wanted to get in, into filmmaking. And after making a couple of short fiction films, um, well, actually, 
I, I moved to Berlin in 1990. So it was the year after the Berlin wall came down and there was all kinds of exciting stuff going on. And I made a couple of short films, kind of improvised pseudo fictional films on the streets, but it, it, they kind of mixed a little bit of documentary elements too. And I was like, oh, this is kind of a, a style that I want to pursue. And then I um, ended up going to film school here and um, I made my, I, I, ended up going back to California for my 10 year high school class reunion. Like I got German television to pay to send me back to my hometown to make a story about called good guys and bad guys about two guys that I liked back in high school and two guys that I really didn't get along with. And the background was all like, what was it like growing up in Southern California during the end of the cold war, like during the Reagan era. And it was so much fun working. We were a three man, a three person crew. We slept at my stepfather's house and it was so fun just cruising around, meeting people, talking to people and being this really small, compact unit. And like a month before I had shot this short fiction film and there were like 50 people on the set and I had three assistants and it was, it was just too much for me. I didn't, it, it, I didn't, I just didn't like it. I really wanted to be out there meeting people. That's my greatest passion is just uh, traveling around and meeting people. I haven't made it to as many countries as you have, but uh, I have I have also experienced like you that everywhere I go, I meet incredible people who are, who I would think who, if you really think about it, it's like they are incredibly, for the most part, incredibly kind to me. And it's, I've always wondered why, why would they be so nice to a complete stranger? But it's, I've experienced that in every single country, country I've ever been to. And that's why I reached out to you because I was like, you know, you got this great kindness message. It's like more of us need to be spreading it. And with whatever means we have and, and whatever language we have or whatever. Um, so that's kind of a long explanation. I just decided that the real world interested me more than making fiction films. <laughs> no, I get it. I mean, it's like I always say that the most beautiful thing that we all possess is our capacity to connect with each other is our mm -hmm. capacity to stay in touch with our humanity. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the most profound ways to do that really is to pick up a camera, go out into the world and tell the story of the world in as raw a fashion as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's what I've been doing for, uh, yeah, about almost 30 years now. Making, making one film after the other and uh, haven't gotten bored yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. What is like a moment on the road that when you've been doing any of your documentarian stuff that has touched you in such a profound way that it changed the course of your life? Oh, that's a big one. I was, I was kind of thinking about this uh, in the last few days and I keep coming back to an incident. This is really, it was the year that I made my first short film and it had nothing to do with my filmmaking. It had to do with my traveling. I had been in Egypt with some, some friends and I learned to scuba dive in the Red Sea and I had to go back to Berlin um, a little bit early to go back to work. And I had to go spend a couple of days in Cairo on my way back. And I was just sitting in a park one day completely alone, feeling pretty lonely, just didn't quite know what I wanted to do with myself that day. And there was this family sitting nearby with a little kid and they kept looking at me. We kept making eye contact and I was the only foreigner around. It was some kind of a, a, a lawn where people were sitting around and I, they looked at me and then I started looking around and I was trying to figure out why are they, why do they keep looking at me? And I was acutely aware that I was the only foreigner there. And then the kid, which must have been, I don't know, three or four years old, walked over to me and gave me a banana. And it was so, it was, it was like, wow, this is really weird. This is like um, totally random. Why did I, do I look hungry? <laughs> why, why did these people give me a banana? It's totally simple gesture, but it was really one of the, the <clears throat> I think it really set me off on a path as a, I was 25 years old at the time of, um, I think it changed the way that I relate to people. And 
made me more open to just random encounters with strangers and also made me um made me tune in a little bit more about what other people might be feeling around me when i would i uh when i see for you know people who are in berlin for instance who clearly are not from here and are feeling a little bit lost i'm more likely now to maybe offer some help <laughs> things like that so that that was a real turning point for me definitely and i would say in fulfilling moments there's lots of those <laughs> yeah and i would say maybe and maybe I'm putting words in your mouth here, but maybe that moment was so beautiful um, because you and that family at one point were like separate. And that one moment of the kid giving you the banana made you one. And that was a beautiful moment of shared humanity. And like I said, I'm putting words into your mouth, but maybe <laughs> that moment of shared humanity is something that you want to share with the world. Does that make any sense or am I just completely projecting my own thing? Leon, you hit it. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. That was a very nice way of putting it, how you put it. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's one of the most beautiful things we can do, right? As mm. filmmakers, let's say, is to take that emotion that we feel and share it with the viewer so the viewer gets to feel it too. And that kind of magnifies the effect of assuming you're doing good stuff, right? And like inspiring mm -hmm. people. It magnifies the effect of goodness that, so that it's not just you who's feeling it. It's, <laughs> it's everyone who's watching the movie who's feeling it. And they right. take that out and, and plant seeds of goodness as well and of humanity as well based on mm -hmm. a movie that you've created, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You are making you are reminding me of a filming moment now that um it, that when we were making the straight guys, we were in this restaurant in Yakutsk in, in Siberia, and um very like a, a small private room, really rustic um wooden walls and, and decor and stuff. And there was a woman there, a Siberian woman, and she had this book of drawings by children about how they imagine this Bering Strait connection, what it would be like if Russia were connected to the United States. And really nice is some art project of, of school kids from, from Russia. And she showed it to us and she presented it to George, the, the head straight guy, the, the, the Czech born mining engineer who had this vision, who revived this vision of the Bering Strait tunnel. And she gave it to us. We were filming this. And he said, um, he was really touched and he said, well, I hope that when I die, I leave behind friendship between Americans and Russians. And it, it was like a really simple gesture. And here was a Siberian woman giving this book to a, a Czech born mining engineer who was a U.S. He'd long been, he was a U.S. citizen at that point. Um, it was just another, a, a moment of, of kindness or, of, 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 you know, a connection there. And it, it it really summarized what we've been experiencing that whole experiencing that whole trip. We met a lot. We met with the people from Yakutia Railways. We saw their train station with their with which hadn't opened yet. We saw how they're building, and I saw that like these American train guys and these Russian train guys they get along really well. <laughs> they understand each other. They the American guys were really fascinated because Russian train tracks are wider. They have a wider gauge, and they're and we got to ride in one of their locomotives. And the Russians were so excited to have us come that they actually arranged a locomotive that was from general electric. It was an American locomotive that apparently works really well in extreme, extremely cold weather. Like Yakutsk is the coldest city in the world. And, um, and it, but it's a, 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 an American locomotive, but it had Russian writing on it. All, all the panels inside, everything was in Russian, but American manufactured. And I thought oh, it was such a, it, fascinating experience and those guys it meant a lot to them to be able to present this american-made locomotive to the american guests and to take them on a ride they got to, we got to ride outside the station for about a kilometer it's just a, a neat moment of connection this is is this is all you know 2018 all, three and a half years ago it all seems kind of incomprehensible today in this anti-russian climate and um 
I have to say, I, I want to go on the record saying I absolutely condemn this war in Ukraine and the, the Russian inv invasion. Um, but I, I think that there's, I find it a shame that there's, it seems to be an attitude in, uh, among many people to condemn everything Russian and, and to, to mark all Russians as evil. Um, my, the reality is that like the, my Russian film crew, they all had to flee the country. They're, they're applying for asylum now in Europe because some of them were, were activists and were having real problems in Russia. And they, and they've had, they've lost everything as well as, as a result of a dumb decision of their uh, leader. It's unfortunate. You know, my heart bleeds for the Ukrainians of two, too, of course. And I, uh, the first week of the war, some of my colleagues and I took a shipment of medical supplies to the border and we brought back a Ukrainian uh, family and arranged housing for them outside of Berlin. And, um, I, and that was a pretty shocking experience for me. Um, what was going on there at the border when we were there? Mm. It it, it, um, it feels horrific. Mm. I'm thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away, but it feels horrific. Mm. Um, and my question to you is: you you have a unique kind of position in the sense that you know a lot of Russians. You've been in a situation where Russians and Americans are getting on to create this beautiful movie, right? Um, how, do you, how do you bring people together? How, I, 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 I'm speaking to you like you're the Dalai Lama, and I'm sorry. You, you're, you're, clearly, you're clearly connected. You're doing things where you're showing humanity. How how do you bring people together in your own little way? How would you bring people together? How would you stop people demonizing? And again, you're right. What's happened is a catastrophe. It is a catastrophe from someone sitting 10,000 miles away in the safety of his house, right? Mm -hmm. It is a catastrophe. But how do you how do you bring people together? How as a filmmaker, like how do you bring people together in this situation? Like if you were going to go and do a movie, another movie about Russia and Ukraine and what's going on, how would you bring them together? No pressure, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, I think it all comes down to... to helping people see what they have in common and focus on what they have in common rather than what is different, like what they don't have in common. I, um, you know, uh, I don't know if you go out drinking with, with, with a bunch of people or whatever, you know, people tend to get along much better <laughs> unless they get really aggressive when they're drinking or something, you know, it, um, I've been at film festivals and stuff. People from all different countries tend to tend to get along quite well, even if their their countries officially are at war with each other or or have their problems. But I, th I think it's it really all boils down to trying to find those points of common humanity that transcend all national borders. And I've been fortunate enough that um, I was able to get a, an education, a good education. I spent a semester abroad in Vienna when I was in college in 1989 and got to travel all over Europe. I got to go to the Soviet Union. I, I, lived it, I lived there for three months. And through that traveling, I just had that experience of how similar everyone is everywhere. And especially in Russia, I had the feeling that, wow, the Russians, they're like, um, they're so much like us Americans. They're really, and I, I tell people like, Russians and Americans were two sides of the same coin. And some people don't want to hear that. And others are like, oh, really? But, you know, there's, we're very similar in so many ways. I mean, you've been to Russia. I mean, you've, you've, you know what I'm talking about. You know, people often say to me, they're like, Leon, what did you learn on all your journeys around the world? And I always respond in the same way. And I tell them, we are all the same. We want to be heard. We want to be loved. We want to be seen. Mm -hmm. At base, in our humanity, 
we are the same. Mm. And I tell them the story of the time I was uh, in India and I ended up sleeping in the slums. And on the outside, the slums look horrific. Poverty, just not pleasant. But if you go on the inside, in the heart, in the soul of the people, there's so much joy. There's so much love. And I remember waking up in the morning one day and seeing this mother kiss her two kids goodbye for school. And in that moment, it hit me in a very beautiful and profound and simple way. That her love for her kids is exactly the same as your love for your kids. We are the same. And that's a really powerful message because whether you're on the left, whether you're on the right, whether you're in the middle, whether you're on the far left or on the far right, if anyone tells you that we are different and that we should hate because of our differences, because of the line on the ground that you're either on the north or the south of, they're lying. Mm. I'm not saying don't defend yourself. I'm not saying bad things don't happen. But at base, as human beings, we are the same. And you've experienced that on all of your journeys around the world. You've experienced that. Again, it's not about like, oh, you know, let's sing Kumbaya and everything's going to work itself out, right? <laughs> That's not the truth. But the truth is that we are the same. And when you start demonizing other people, when you start dehumanizing other people, it is very easy to start doing atrocities. That is what they did in the Second World War. They were dehumanizing the Jews. That mm. is what they did in Rwanda. And a million people died in a few months. Mm. When you feel or you hear or you see anyone dehumanizing another human being, at that moment, one must get very, very worried. Because mm. it's funny, I... I I, I shared this on another podcast but that I did, but I, I, I heard a quote from Voltaire. I'm probably going to butcher it now, but when you, can, <laughs> when you can, something to the effect of, if you can make someone believe absurdities, you can make them commit atrocities, mm. right? And yeah. that is like all the way to the point of Auschwitz, right? Mm. But the steps to Auschwitz are paved with that. And it is so important. This is part of the reason why I do what I do, and I would imagine why you do what you do. It's so important to get each and every person to see another human being beyond the way that the news is dictating what they should look at them like, from the heart, from the heart. Like I see you as a, hu as a fellow human being. With with experiences, good, bad, doesn't mean that, you know, you don't have the capacity to do bad things. We all do. But my baseline is that you and I are the same. Mm. And I will go from that baseline. Right. Uh, and sometimes I go off on tangents and I listen to it after and I'm like, hmm, OK, well, that wasn't very nice. <laughs> that wasn't very good. Or I'm like, oh, that was good. So I don't know what that one's <laughs> going to be. But it's just it's just. I see you, right? And clearly you see people because you've gone out into the world and created these beautiful documentaries about seeing people. Mm. And it's a lot of fun. <laughs> it most certainly is. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, there are those bad it, sometimes it's it sometimes it's not so fun. So what would you do? Uh, what is your next project? Um, I spent, uh, well, um, I was in Cameroon in Africa in, in a few months ago, in January. Um, I was hired as a cameraman to go film at a chicken farm where uh, a young couple, a young family, they are introducing a new kind of chicken called a dual purpose chicken that uh, they want to revolution. They want, they want to, they want to help small time farmers, uh, get uh, free themselves from the global, the big global chicken breeders and, and become more independent. Um, 
so they could breed their own chickens. And they're, they're a special kind of chickens that can both lay eggs and get fat so you can eat them. So I was filming there. And um, last summer, I spent five weeks on the north coast of Alaska, at the northernmost point of the United States in Utkiakvik, uh, with four atmospheric scientists from Colorado State University who were doing some research on the effects of thawing permafrost on the atmosphere, on, on weather patterns and stuff. They have this hypothesis that um, some kind of microscopic particles that are in this frozen earth are when it's the earth is thawing, that it's, it's getting into the waterways and, be, and the wind is sweeping it up into the clouds and it's changing the weather patterns and making the weather more erratic. I was, I was intrigued by that. So I was kind of an embedded filmmaker who got to travel with them. And, and um, now I'm uh, pitching, around, pitching this project and looking for partners for it. And when people watch your movies, what do you hope that they get out of them? Of course, each movie is different. But generally, mm -hmm. when people watch your movies, what is it that you want someone to get from them? Oh, boy. I'd be happy if they wake up the next morning still thinking about the film. Because I think so much of what we watch these days, what we, what we consume, we forget about it right away and i know when i wake up if i've seen a movie and i wake up the next morning and i'm still thinking about it, it's like wow i watched something that had some kind of impact on me and my goal is always to to make films that touch people's hearts but also engage their minds that have the right combination because i think that's the real trick you want people to be moved while they're watching it but you want to engage them intellectually so that maybe they actually go through life in a slightly different way. Maybe they become more kind or something. Maybe they become more empathetic because of uh, what they've seen on the screen. Uh, maybe if it's depending on the subject matter, maybe they decide to, to go out and vote. Maybe they haven't voted in years. And now they decide, they realize that, wow, their vote, vote does matter and they're going to go out and vote. So there's, there's little, I, I'm someone who believes that, that creative people actually can have an impact in the world <clears throat> and that a film that also sometimes single films can have a huge impact on the world. There have been examples of those. I mean, just think of something like I'm being totally random. Like I don't know the in an inconvenient truth, the, the film with uh, Al Gore, I mean, about 15 years ago, or whatever. I think it really set up. I think it really increased uh, the general awareness about environmental issues, and that that's great. You know, sometimes films can have that impact. It helps if you have a former vice president in the film. Um. That, that does, doesn't always happen. Um, and I think if you go into making the film with some huge goal in mind, you might fail. I, I, am, I usually just want to have some kind of big question in life that I'm trying to, uh, trying to find answers to and let that guide me through the film and take me to the people who, who become the, the contributors in the film. And in the end, if people are interested in it and, feel like they've had a good experience watching it and it wasn't a waste of their time, then I'm happy. That's a beautiful answer to say that basically you want your film to touch someone's life and to make them shift their perspective. That really is all one can ask when it comes to a documentary film is, mm. and a film of any film or TV show, et cetera, or any piece of art, will it touch the humanity of another human being mm. so that that human being lives their life a little bit better than before they watched your movie. Mm. I mean, that's, that's beautiful. So uh, I, I wish, I wish you the capacity to do that with every film you do and the, every film you've done. Uh, and I very much look forward to watching uh, the new one. When is it coming mm. out? Um, it, uh, it's, it's being released theatrically in Germany in June, on June 2nd. It's going to be in theaters. And then I think sometime later in the year, it'll kind of be out on VOD and maybe early next year. We're trying to get it onto PBS in the United States, get okay. a, a PBS broadcast. Right. I wanted to mention one more thing about um, one of the examples that the guys, the straight guys mention over and over again when talking about the U.S. and Russia and this idea of like when people say, how can the Americans and Russians collaborate? That, that'll never work. He's like, look up at the sky, the International Space Station. It's been floating around for 30 years. And, you know, a, a lot of us have seen images of the space station on television or whatever, and images of like 
American astronauts and Russian cosmonauts working together, smiling together, playing music together. <clears throat> and I think that it's my personal belief that this can be, we can do this on earth as well. And we have like a major glitch going on now. And I want to encourage people to look beyond that and, and to really look for solutions for, for, you know, diplomatic solutions. Cause I, I, I I'm very concerned that about all this, uh, uh, militarization and send weapons, send weapons, send weapons. My response is send diplomats, send diplomats, negotiate. We can find some peaceful solutions. So that's what I'm about. <laughs> there's your, there's your next movie. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Well, look, man, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Um, yeah. I wish thanks you for the having best me. of luck in creating magic and continuing to create magic. Um, mm -hmm. And if there's any help that I can give you in, in the new, new movie, just let me know. Okay. Uh, and when I come to Berlin, we should definitely meet up. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. You can play Twister. Is it Twister in the back? Uh, there is Twister. Is right here. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> oh yeah, my kids will play with you. They love it. <laughs> That's so cool. All right, man. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. No worries. Bye. <laughs> Hello everyone, it's Leon here, AKA The Kindness Guy. If you like my videos, which I hope you do, don't forget to press the subscribe button and also to ring the little bell so that the notifications notify you that I have